Hello, and welcome to, day, to today's lecture in the Women and Gender Performance in the Phoenician Homeland and Diaspora Lecture Series, which is co-sponsored by the Bade Museum of Archaeology, the Archaeological Research Facility at UC Berkeley, and East Carolina University. My name is Brooke Norton. I'm the Associate Curator of the Bade Museum. And before we get started today, I would like to begin by reading a brief statement on behalf of the Bade Museum. We would like to begin by acknowledging that Berkeley, California is on the territory of the Huchiun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenye Alone. We respect the land and the people who have stewarded it throughout many generations, and we honor their elders and their ancestors. We are living in a moment that warrants deep reflection on our past and present. As a museum dedicated to advancing knowledge of the archaeology and history of the ancient Levant, the Bade Museum welcomes scholarly discussions across boundaries of nationality, religion, and gender identity. In many global contexts, equal access to healthcare, education, fair wages, and human rights is contested on the basis of sex, gender, and other identity categories. In an effort to bring light to these timely issues, to serve a broader public audience online, and to connect to the local community that it serves, the museum is taking action to become a more inclusive, welcoming, an equitable institution that practices the philosophy of radical inclusion adopted by its parent institution, Pacific School of Religion. One of these steps is the continued creation of public programming. Through this lecture series, we hope to highlight new and established scholars who are engaging with risky and marginalized topics concerning women, gender performance, and sexuality in the past. We invite you to participate in these programs so that together we can listen, learn, and work towards creating a more inclusive museum community. Thank you so much for joining us today. I would like to now invite my colleague, Dr. Helen Dixon to the floor to introduce today's speaker. Thank you so much, Brooke. It is my deep pleasure to introduce again, lucky for us, a uh, second time in the series, Maria Lopez Bertran, who is Associate Professor at the Department of Art History of the Universitat de Valencia in Spain. She received her PhD degree in history from the Universitat Pampo Fabra in 2007. Between 2010 and 2012, she was postdoctoral researcher at the Foundation for Education and Culture, FECIT, in, uh, in Spain, and she worked as an honorary research fellow at the Univer Archaeology Unit of the University of Glasgow. She was appointed Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow at the Universitat Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona between 2014 and 2016. And she's participated in various national and international research projects that have allowed her to excavate in Phoenician and Punic sites like the Tyre al Bas Cemetery in Lebanon, or the Lixis colonies in La Roche, Morocco, Cerro de Villar in Malaga, Spain, or the site of Sulki or Saint Antioco in Sardinia. She has also been a visiting scholar at the University of Tübingen, Brown University, and at the Getty Research Institute. Currently, she's working on the art and iconography of the Iron Age Mediterranean from an embodied and gendered perspective. And more specifically, she specialized in chloroplastic art from a material culture perspective. In fact, she's currently co-editing a book entitled Art as Material Culture to be published by Rutledge in 2024. I can't wait to learn and teach from that book. So today we invite her to speak on Punic Women as Ritual Agents, Evidence for Material and Visual Culture. Maria, thank you so much for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you, Helen, for yeah, this kind of presentation. I share my screen. Okay, so can you see? Yes. Okay. So um, good morning or good afternoon or good evening. And first of all, I would like to begin by thanking the organizers of this lecture series organized by the Bade Museum at the Pacific School of Religion, the Archaeological Research Facility at Berkeley and the East Carolina University. I really appreciate they allowed me to participate twice and I hope to leave out this double invitation. So as you can see from the title of my presentation, I will concentrate on the role of women as active participants in different kinds of rights that, that can be traced at two sides of the Western Mediterranean. The two case studies where I have tried to identify the female agency are the open air shrine of Laogaida, uh, located on the south coast of um, Iberia, 
and the cave shrine of Ascuyara on the island of Ibiza. But first of all, uh, I want to share with you the outline of this lecture. Initially, I will present briefly the two sides. After that, I will concentrate on shedding some light to the participation of women. And finally, I would like to finish by showing an example of how to disseminate the results of your research to a wider audience. This topic is being highly encouraged by the Spanish and European policies, especially with the research financed by public funding, as it is uh, the case I'm presenting you today. So um, let's begin with the first point, and I will present you now the Algaida Shrine, located at San Lucar de Barrameda, uh, a small town in the province of Cadiz, south of Iberia. It is located, the Algaida, on the Guadalquivir estuary, and an area that has changed significantly over time. When La, La Algaida was used as a rural shrine, that is between roughly the 7th and the 1st centuries uh, BCE, the, the area was first a speed barrier, as you can see here, I'm showing you, and later an island on the eastern bank of the, of the estuary. The site was excavated between 1978 and 1984, and it has been partially looted but an astratography, a stratigraphy of four levels has been identified. Layer four contains the Punic and late Punic materials dated between the fourth and the second centuries BCE, when the site presented several constructions. However, an earlier religious use has been suggested on the strength of some of the materials dated to the seventh and sixth centuries BCE. The main ritual uh, space was an open air shrine. It was, was an open air area around which several constructions, you can see here the, the layout, have been identified together with a well, which is located here. The constructions between three and five meters long were built from masonry and pebbles and were used for different purposes. Two of them have been uh, defined as the storerooms to store the votive offerings, and another one uh, has been defined as the living quarters for the workers at the shrine. The objects are buried and abandoned. Cooking and serving pottery, oil lamps with traces of burning, coins, decorative objects for the body, clay figurines, and movable bronze artworks. These materials suggest a panorama similar to Ascuyaran, the other case of study, a place where people prepare and consume food, cremated and some substances, and deposited a variety of botic offerings. As, as I have just said, La Algaida is located on a landscape that has undergone rapid geographical changes some of them in the course of individual lifetimes. In fact, its location in the estuary has been argued as a reason for its sacralization. It would have had a strategic position in the maritime route that connected the settlements around the former estuary, defining its role as both as a sanctuary and a, and a depot for sailors and traders. In addition, in spite of um, of its relatively low uh, height, the shrine was located at the end of the speed barrier, 200 meters away from the water, and at the highest point between 8.5 and 10 meters above the sea level. The environment of Nalgaida um, could have been key, a key component in the sacred perce perception of the site. It is agreed that La Algaida was the sanctuary mentioned by Estrabo dedicated to a goddess of, of the Lux Dubia or Phosphorus. Phosphorus means bringer of the light and is the morning star, the planet Venus in its morning appearance. Lux Dubia can refer, can refer to both the twilight or the downward of, 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 of the first light. 
but in this case, it is associated with the morning light due to its association with Phosphorus. And it has been discussed whether the goddess of this sanctuary was Astarte or Tinit, or Tanit, no? it depends. The perception of the morning light could have elicited, uh, elicited an emotional response and participated actively in the creation of a cosmological world will. Moreover, various kinds of oil limes with traces of burning have been identified. In addition, their presence has been related to nocturnal rites, which are well documented in other areas of the Mediterranean, in connection with the goddesses, especially the Mete, and with the rites of fecundity, marriage, and well-being. I will come back later to this uh, topic. Moving to, to the other case study, Ascuyaram is a cave sanctuary on the southern hillside of the San Vicente Valley, you can see here, in Ibiza, eh, near the stream of Sacala. San Vicente is a fluvial valley with terraces formed by limestone and marl, and a good hydrological features that create natural springs. The cave is oriented to the southeast and is um, 150 meters above the sea level, and only one and a half kilometer from the beach, and offers an excellent view of the sea. The cave has a total surface area of 200 square meters, and it was in use from the fourth century to the second century BCE, reaching its peak of activity during the third century, when pottery, bones, and especially clay figurines were deposited there. The handmade pottery, however, suggests that the cave was also frequented in the Bronze Age. In addition, there is no agreement on the date of the abandonment of the cave in the Roman period. The scarcity of the materials has been attributed either to looting or to the fact that the occupation was temporary, or the, to the possibility that the Romans frequented the site until the second century AD. The cave uh, is divided especially, especially into three parts. The first is an artificial quadrangular hole created by two walls built into the stone and which may have had a roof made of clay and cane. The natural cave is formed by two main galleries. Uh, the first is a large area uh, with a low ceiling between uh, one meter and two meters high covered by a partially destroyed stone vault, which comprises four different areas or, room, or rooms presenting an irregular profile and a large number of stalagmites that make it difficult to move freely inside this part. This area has been defined as the possible entrance to the cave and would have received some natural light. The second one, is, the, is an oval room five meters high and 80 square meters, which has been defined as the Holy of Holies due to the vast number of materials recovered. It also presents an irregular layout and has a clear open space because the speleothems are located along its sides. This is a reconstruction we have done of this artificial entrance you can see here, I am showing you according to the layout of the cave and its section. You can see also a rectangular cistern at the entrance of the cave that directly into the rock, which collects rainwater. The cave was excavated at the beginning of the 20th century. Unfortunately, no information whatsoever was recorded concerning their cause. Significant amounts of pottery were found, in particular cooking, eating, and drinking vessels, as well as some amphora. Many of these vases are smaller than usual and can be considered as miniatures. The presence of large quantities of animal bones, almost exclusively sheep and goats, shows that eating was also a regular activity in or outside the cave and suggests that sacrificial meals 
what are significant features of the rituals performed at Esquiera. Careful analysis of the faunal remains has also shown that most of the animals, or most of the animal skulls were burned and that the animals had been slaughtered in the cave itself. Other finds include coins mint in Ibiza, two stones that may have been varieties to judge from their conic se section. You can see here one, um, and two gold medallions. Eh? I'm showing you one of these two gold medallions. Also remarkable is a small altar, approximately of 10, uh, cent uh, 10 centimeters high. But the most impressive materials are the terracotta figures, including more than 1,000 1, terracotta fragments that have uh, recently published in 2022 in an excellent book I am showing, I'm showing you here, edited by Maricruz Marin Ceballos, Maria Belén, and Ana Maria Jiménez Flores. In this publication, they have made a classification of the figurines into two, two main types. The winged or bell-shaped figurines representing the images of uh, Tanit or, or Tini, and a, a, a group called uh, Barrier Types, including from, uh, to, from more to less numerous figurines with torch and animals, as the one you see here, female head incense burners, enthroned figurines, terracotta wearing multiple necklaces, musicians, uh, fig figurines wearing calatos or belts, uh, busts, anagras, and um, a small number of masculine heads and also a big amount of um, undetermined uh, types. The winged uh, figurines, which are unique to the Spigaram cave, the pig, um, uh, females uh, wearing a, a calatus. The presence of wings too, as you can see here or, or here, and the decorative elements like uh, caduceus, the solar disc, lotus flowers, or uh, mandrake relate these objects to the goddess team, emphasizing her astral features and the ones related with safe travels and fecundity. Another evidence that show the connection between Tini and the cave is the bronze plate uh, with a double inscription engraved at different, at different moments. First, in the 5th century BCE, the inscription mentions a male divinity, most probably the god Reshef Melkar. The recent one, which is the one I am showing, showing you in the, in the, on the slide, is dated at the second century BCE, written in Neo-Punic, uh, which mentions the goddess Tini, together with the epithet God, which means good luck or happiness. Jose Angel Zamora has just published an exhaustive study in commemoration of the centenary of its discovery of this bronze inscription, and has advocated that the second inscription was written by a scribe who was a relevant priest in charge of rebuilding the cave. In contrast to La Algaida, which is an open-air shrine, the morphological features of Ascuyaram suggest that water would have been widely used in the rituals performed there. In the nearby, in the nearby stream, and in the adjacent mountains, there are three springs, all within 500 meters of the cave. So the area would have had a sufficient water supply. This data is relevant because many Phoenician and Punic sanctuaries perform a water cult linked to divinities such as Astarte or Adonis. And so the abundance of water may well have been a factor in the choice of the cave as a site of worship. The existence of water resources is also essential to explain the human occupation of the valley. According to the survives carried out in the, in, the, in the stream, the first evidence of Punic inhabitants uh, is dated to the beginning of the fourth century. From that time, 
two rural areas with a large concentration of amphorae were documented. During the third and the second centuries BCE, when at precisely the activity on, in the cave was at its peak, the rural settlement exploiting the resources of, of the valley increased in number from eight to 14. So these farmsteads were located along the central stream of the valley and were close to each other. And probably the people who live in these farms in these farmsteads were the users and the visitors to uh, Esquiera. The cave uh, also contained what has been called by Ruth Whitehouse, and I quote, abnormal water, and end of the quote, understood as an extraordinary form uh, such as stalactites, stalagmites, and waterfalls, which would have made the cave a particular attractive site for worship. In the cave, water is also clearly attested by the rectangular sister built at its entrance attributed a cultic use for lustral cleaning of the, devot of the devotees before entering. The abnormal, of, of, the abnormal water of Escuyeram has been mainly identified in the inner room, uh, the so-called Holy of Holies, with traces of, of speleothems and with the identification of shallow pools of water resembling mirrors. This gives the impression that the devotees choose this inner part, because according to their world view, it was the ideal place to commune with the supernatural forces, a place where their sensorial and emotional experiences would have been most intense. Before moving to the third point of the lecture, I want to highlight a joint idea of the two shrines, which is the topic that I have already published about the kinetic rituals, pilgrimage, or sacred journeys. Both Ascuyaram and Lalgaida are commonly defined as rural shrines related to agriculture, fertility, and navigation. It has been highlighted that ritual performances should be understood in a wide perspective, focusing not just on the rites performed at the site, but on the journeys made by the worshippers. Thus, people began to perform their rites when their voyages began. As a consequence, Ascuyaram and Lalgaida are particular destinations visited repeatedly over the course of a few centuries, of a few centuries in what have been termed pilgrimages uh, or uh, kinetic rituals, eh? religiously motivated journeys to sanctuaries or sacred spaces either with or without architecture. In the present case study, people visited their shrines either on foot or by sea, and may have carried out other bodily movements like processions or dances. At Escuyaram, for example, two female figurines of dancers and musician figurines has, uh, have been recorded. And, and, and in the Algaida, rings bearing images of musicians have also been uh, found. Pilgrimages often uh, coincide with the movement of celestial bodies and the passing of time, for example, a specific dates or holidays. And there is evidence of this at Escuyeram. The presence of tooth marks on animals suggests that animals were sacrificed during the month of February and March maybe to celebrate the rebirth of nature and the end of the winter and the beginning of the spring. <clears throat> at uh, at Lalgaida, pilgrimages either on foot or across the water would have been a natural practice given its location. However, it is purely speculative to relate the visits with the specific moments of time, the tides, the passing of fish, or even seasonal celebration. What seems clear is the connection with celestial uh, movements, especially with Venus, Ven Venus, the key planet using ancient navigation. So moving to the second point of this lecture, it seems clear that the main divinities of the two sacred areas are goddesses of fertility, understood in a wide sense. 
I aim to shed more light on this me on the meaning of the fertility in this particular context and engender the visitors of the cult places by focusing on their material culture, especially their choroplastic artworks and body uh, ornaments. I begin with the Algaida, and um, the scholars have already suggested a female character for the shrine, arguing that visit women visited the space to celebrate weddings, to pray for wood labor, or to protect their offspring. The maternal element has also been linked to phosphorus because morning light was believed to be connected to labor and birth. Certainly, the site's visual repertoire suggests the performance of protective and maternal rites. La Algaida contains significant choroplastic artworks. Two figurines of the choroforos type, yeah, with a woman holding a baby in her arms, may, de may depict women presenting their children to divinities for their well-being. Another small fragment I am showing you re represents a baby, uh, a baby's torso, arms, and legs. Although it has been tentatively ascribed to the choroforos type, its corporality, uh, with a chubby appearance and crossed legs and apparent nakedness, recall to the temple boy iconography. Another figurine that may exemplify the role of modern practices, especially breastfeeding, is a fragment of a naked torso with two plate buttons uh, representing the breast, and also a triangu tri triangular incision uh, representing a necklace holding yeah, another clay button, uh, possibly a pendant, interpreted as an amulet. In our, my view, this specimen highlights the close connection between women and healing practices. The importance of rest is also attested by the 72 small glass breast-like pendants, the one you see here, and I apologize for the quality of the, of the picture, yeah, which this, this breast, the small breast, are called uh, mamelas. Yeah? These objects are rarely found in the Iberian Peninsula, and in fact, they are specific to rituals at the Algaida. Yeah? They, have, they have been identified as amulets, in connection to fertility and motherhood. I think uh, that these objects may also materialize the role of breast milk in curative practices. Other objects connected to healing uh, practices are 27 eyeglasses beads, interpreted as powerful means for expelling bad luck and, ex and exerting magical power. Or two silver plagues, I'm showing you only one of the silver plagues, with embossed, embossed eyes, suggesting per, perhaps that these eyes uh, were amulets of um, protecting from diseases or bad luck. In fact, um, the female terracotta figurines I'm showing you here are lavishly decorated with different kinds of amulets. And some of them are defined as small boxes, possibly containing oils with magical properties. And in fact, um, Pliny the Elder, in his Historia Naturalis, complained that men were wearing rings as if they were ornaments typical of women. No? So there is an association between um, ornamentation, magic, and, and women. Another case study very interesting are the otoliths of Corvina, hmm? A small bones located inside the head of the fish with an alabaster appearance, I'm showing you here, which has been found in, in a number of uh, Iron Age uh, sites on the Atlantic coast. In La Algaida, precisely, 49 specimens of otoliths has been identified as votive offerings. And otoliths, uh, interestingly, had to be deliberately separated from the rest of the head. So it is likely that they were selected on purpose. Why they were selected on purpose? Because um, probably these bones were used as charms and amulets because of their curative properties. In fact, again, Pliny the Elder 
attributes marvelous virtues to these uh, small bones. We have more uh, materials, no, like the terracotta poppy. This is a, an image of a terracotta poppy that could indicate the use of this plant in curative rites. The Smith and Evers papyri show medical application of poppy plants to cure breast abscesses, to calm crying babies, or as eye, eye drops and ointments. Composed of many grains, poppy capsules were also believed to have an aphrodisiac properties and were a symbol of fertility. Representations of poppies have been found in the Levant, and proof of their consumption has been recovered in Cyprus, with the identification of pipes to smoke opium at the temple of Kition associated with the cult of Astarte. In the Greek choroplastic productions, poppies are also associated with female cults, such as the worship of Demeter, and the achievement, and the achievement of altered states of consciousness in rites of passage preparing women for marriage. In addition, in the written sources, women offer poppy seeds in different religious festivals. <clears throat> the large amount of oil lines in Algaida may indicate the cremation of poppy seed oil and other substances that may also have therapeutic properties. Another plant that may have been used uh, in Algaida is mistletoe, yeah, or piscum albu, which Ramon Corzo, the, 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 the archaeologist of the site, considers to be depicted on the, uh, on the calatos of the uh, head-shaped incense bar. You know? I'm showing you here this uh, representation of mistletoe. The plant is represented with three clay globules, you know, as you can see in the here and at the center of the calatus. And again, Pliny the Elder speaks of its powerful curative capacities and especially its ability to prevent sterility. The materials of Lalgaida also open up the possibility of the presence of children in the shrine. Some of the rings eh, deposited there are very small, less than, less than one centimeter of diameter and maximum of two centimeters, and would uh, only have been worn by children who were profusely protected with amulets. No? Well, we remember the, the temple boys no? full of uh, amulets. The presence of a small body offerings, like the one I'm showing you here, this, this uh, small pot, uh, may also indicate the participation of children in rituals as miniature pots and similar objects are usually interpreted as tools used to socialize children and involve them in daily activities, you know, as teaching aids for the enculturation of thoughts. So moving to the second case study, as Kuyaram, although the big amount of figurines are related to Tini, to the goddess Tini, other figurines have been defined as images of women or devotees that can be linked to female rights. For instance, veiled figurines, as the one I'm showing you here, have been identified by Maricruz Cruz de Bayos with the gesture of an anacalypsis or unveiling with the right hand. No? So you can see with the right hand, he's opening um, the, the veil and with the left hand, um, he, the, the, the terracotta is, uh, is holding you know, a, a tray, you know, a, a tray. As explained by the authors, the gesture of unveiling is a Greek iconographical feature that can be connected either with wedding rites or with the status of married, uh, of married women. Another type of figuring that is related to the same idea are the ones I'm showing you here that presents a bell. As you can see in the left side of the slide, the figurine is uh, unveiled, and it has been suggested that this type could make reference to unmarried women because of the lack of veil and the presence of the bell that, according to Greek tradition, is an adequate object for young women. Be as it may be, I'm not suggesting that mm, there, is, there was any transposition of this gesture and right to the Punicas Cuyaram. 
only that these iconographies fit well in the creation of the lo local female activities performed in the cave, which is why people choose to introduce these images, but they are not look, facing a, a god, uh, um, a Greek goddess or a Greek tradition. The two figurines holding the tray with food are significant at this point. You, know, you can see here there's the, he's opening the veil, but also has this tray with uh, with uh, food. Um, because food are significant because uh, the tray carries uh, round pieces of clay that has been interpreted as bread or cakes in the light of the evidence from the Old Testament and Near Eastern archaeology. These cakes or bread were food offerings to divinities, mainly female ones. And some of them probably were decorated using a stamp with images related to fertility and well being, like lotus flowers or rosettes. No stamps, like the ones I'm showing you here, have been found in Spuderam. But mm, in other areas of Ibiza, especially in the main uh, cemetery in Puches Mulins, many stamps have been found. Thus, it is probably that the inhabitants of San Vicente uh, Valley and the visitors to Ascuyaram Cave may have been familiar with this ritual um, practice of presenting uh, bread uh, and a specific bread decorated with these uh, stamps. In, in addition, another agricultural reenactment could take place in Ascuyaram which is the offering of first fruits at the beginning or at the end of the harvest. Thus, not only creating a sense of time through seasonal celebrations, but also legitimizing the possession of land by different families. This is certainly the case of Ibiza, where small shrines proliferate all over the island, precisely at the sites where there were farmsteads. Another element to highlight is the presence of kalatos eh, in many of these figurines. And I think that the kalatos are meaningful objects that embody the ritual agency of the local inhabitants who choose to decorate a highly significant, uh, to, to choose to decorate a highly significant object as it is a terracotta figurine locally made um, with a, with a, with a, with this basket, yeah, with this calatos, uh, in relation to their daily task, their daily task, um, because this basket, yeah, this calatos, was used for women in to hold wool, fabrics, fruits, flowers, or food. Mm -hmm. So this case study, the case study of Ascuyaram, demonstrates how women were involved in the rites performed uh, there and how human fertility, uh, especially female and land fertility, are interrelated. This, this, this association can also be seen clearly in ancient Mesopotamia, for instance, where the vocabulary of reproduction, of human reproduction, is based on, is based on agricultural concepts uh, that reflect uh, sexuality, uh, that reflects the connection between sexuality and uh, reproduction. So, in this final part of the talk, I want to present a transfer action that I've developed together with other colleagues as a member of the Ars Maya Research Group, based mainly at the Department of Art History of my university, the Universitat de Valencia. These groups, the Ars Maya, brings together an interdisciplinary team of scholars specializing in the study of pre-Hispanic and Mediterranean cultures who are engaged in various lines of research. One of them is the study of ancient art and archaeology from a gender perspective, in order to reassess the assumptions that informed early discourses on the societies of the past, in which the participation of women in economic, artistic, or intellectual activities in complex societies has been largely ignored. With this in mind, in recent years, our research group has disseminated the results of our research through the creation of images 
in which the, women, the women of the past appeared as protagonists of important economic and creative tasks that were traditionally attributed exclusively to men. In many cases, in spite of evidence that no such gender inequality actually existed. We collaborate with the artist Erika Mejida Hansen. The creative process is highly enriching thanks to the use of a variety of methodologies. In the preparatory phase of these drawings, we create a dossier of objects and, su and suggestions for our artist, Erika, in which uh, through images, objects, texts, and conversations, we explain the, architect the, arch the architectural features, the shape and decorative patterns of the pottery, the, the colors of the clothes, uh, the body decoration, etc. After presenting these materials, we began a fruitful dialogue with Erika regarding the composition of the scene, discussing what elements should be included and what perspective should be used to best communicate our message. During this intense process of continuous communication, several black and white sketches were produced. One of the images we have created yeah, is, of course, the Squiram Cave. Uh, in this drawing, we wanted to reinforce some ideas that I have just presented. First, instead of focusing on the rites performed inside the cave, especially keeping in mind the difficulties in trying to reproduce shadowed actions, we put the emphasis on the idea of pilgrimage and community. And that is why we are facing the artificial entrance. No? So the main action is in this artificial ent entrance I showed you before. That way, we have related the shrine in its landscape, reinforcing the farms on the slopes of the mountain and the seascape with the arrival of two sheaves. No? I'm pointing you the, the sheaves and these farmsteads I have already mentioned to you. You can see also how crowded is the path to the, to the, to the shrine, referring to this possible agricultural rites of festivities we have already mentioned. The drawing also shows the multivocality of shrines. Following the material and visual culture, two female musicians are performing music um, accompanied by a man carrying a goat, an animal which is also consumed. In a prominent place of the drawing, we have recreated an adult woman carrying a characteristic body of tannin, of, of tannin, accompanied by an adult man with an incense burner. We have also included two kids as they are normally absent from the narrative. And behind them, we see uh, a man, an elder man carrying an amphora with a shape documented in the side and another adult man with carrying a sheep. All of them, as you can see, wear necklaces with amulets, especially the children, no? which uh, normally are overprotected. You can also see the concentration of the houses, as I show you here, on the slope, no? mentioning these farms, uh, farm houses that I've just mentioned. We, uh, we have also been inspired by the body deco decoration of the local figurines, like the, you see in the slide, for reproducing the headdresses or the javelin that the woman is, is wearing. In the background, there are also men and women of different ages uh, carrying offerings of food on trays, and it's the one you can see here, probably with this bread, or semi-liquid inside serving, uh, uh, serving pottery and cooking pottery. We have tried to recreate the multivocality of ritual agents, visualizing especially the female know-how and also different agents, ages from kids to elderly and different ethnic origins in order to highlight the heterogeneity of people. Uh, most recently, and I come back to this image I showed you in the previous uh, conference, most recently, we have recreated an idealized portrait of the Carthaginian princess Sophonisba, who lived during the Second Punic War and was the daughter of Asdrubal. She held, as you know, influence over the Numidian political landscape, and she was very famous and became legendary because she poisoned herself rather than be humiliated in a Roman triumph. 
This, in fact, this episode, in fact, is the most represented in the European paintings. Eh? We always see a woman semi-naked in the act of killing herself. On the contrary, with this imagined portrait we have um, made with, uh, with the Ars Maya group, we want to reinforce another dimension of Sofonisba's life, the young age, it is believed that she died between when she was 13 and 15 years old, and her talent as a musical performer, thus focusing on her life and not on her death. So to finish, thanks to contextual analysis of the material and visual culture of the two shrines devoted to goddesses, I have tried to demonstrate how communities, including the preeminence of women and possibly children too, appear to have been essential ritual agents at both, at both shrines in the performance of agricultural, marital, curative, and caregiving practices. Thanks for your attention. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. This, uh, these reconstructions are um, so juicy, so rich, so uh, wonderful. I can't imagine a better way of drawing people into this sort of niche research topic that we're all interested in. Um, thank you so much for showing us some of that, uh, those artist renditions. Could we actually start there with a couple of questions about the details? Um, I, I'm wondering what was the most difficult one to explain or to communicate to the artist and where you really realize um, the limits of your knowledge, you know, I mean, what we know, what we can know. Which, uh, which uh, I put the, the general drawing, okay? Yes, any of the drawings, whichever you were okay. talking about, this dialogue back and forth where you're explaining yeah. the colors, you're explaining the fabrics, the materials, <laughs> but then where do you realize we can't even, I don't know how to explain this one to you. <laughs> uh, no, it's, 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 it's a very intensive uh, working process because the artist, he, she's an excellent artist, but she's not trained... She's, she knows a lot about pre-Hispanic because we, we also make drawings of pre especially Maya, but uh, she's not used to Phoenician or Mediterranean archaeology. So um, it's very interesting because we have to explain everything. We have to give her extra literature. And because she loves archaeology and history, she sometimes uh, do, uh, she does research on her own, which is also dangerous because sometimes eh, uh, she ended up with information which is, is not correct and you have always to be uh, careful to inform her that look Erika this is okay this is not okay um, so it's 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 exhausting I mean uh, for preparing this school year and recreation we spend almost two months uh, with our uh, almost everyday dialogue no? of uh, WhatsApps, emails, and PowerPoints, and everything. Yes. I can completely imagine this, and, and uh, you know, maybe even having to answer questions you've never thought of before, like, what are the hats made of, and what are the, I don't know. Um, I also noticed, I think that there was no sort of formal priest, priestess, religious official in the reconstructions, or did I miss one? No, there's no yeah. official priest, although I have to say that in the, in in the book of Jose Angel Zamora, uh, which is um, 2000, well, it was published uh, now, um, he really advocates for a for a priest, no, for a regular uh, priest uh, in charge of the cave. Uh, well, I think it's not uh, opposite, no. That you can that it can be as a Both priest, no? yeah. um, but so you can go also on your own. I mean, uh, it's not exclusive, no. Right, right. Yeah, I think that's very plausible. Um, well, we have a million questions already in here, yeah. and we have someone looking on YouTube for, for new ones. So if you're watching on YouTube, please feel free to write in a question in the chat there. Um, but I wanted to start sort of back at the beginning. Uh, you mentioned for La Raida that you have these nocturnal potentially nocturnal rituals, and they may seem similar to some we know from the cult of Demeter uh, with oil, barley. For those of us who, you know, some of our, our watchers are not um, from the oh, classical yeah. side of things, could you explain a little bit more about what you're imagining there with uh, nocturnal rituals at these open-air sanctuaries? 
I yes, they well, what they said is that uh, these nocturnal rites were in relation of the incubatio, mm. which is like a healing process, no? Where you you get uh, safe or you get uh, in good health, whereas you are sleeping because you receive uh, the the. The, the goddess or the the god is visiting you while you are sleeping so yeah. that's why uh, you need to be there at night and sleep because the sleep is a uh, therapy no? it's therapeutic nice. therapeutical yeah. beautiful yeah so incubating a dream that might have instructions or even a visit that might bring some healing something like that is, is that right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, what about the iconography? Um, I, I know the figurine corpus is newly published from Escularam, but um, what about this medallion that you showed briefly on the slide, um, which seems like a slightly different set of iconography from the figurine corpus? Do you see any interesting uh, evocations in that medallion? Do you think it's sort of a one-off or um, do you actually see some parallels with the figurine corpus? Well, the, the especially with the with the tiny representation, they have decorations on the body which is similar to the gold medallions, no? With these um, uh, caduceus or uh, yeah, yeah, this uh, maybe this Uraeus so, or something, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah, and it's also you can see the same patterns in the in the mold in the in this mold bread that I I also put you on one really? of the slides. It's the same. It's the same uh, iconography. Could I so, impose and ask you to bring that slide up again and we could look at the yeah. bread mold images just for fun? Uh, let me see. I'm, I'm sharing now? No, I'm not sharing. No, uh, no, uh, no you're not sharing now. Okay, if but I'm going to share let, again. Let me see. Um, so I'm sharing now, yes. Beautiful, yes. And this, these are the, the moment you can see, no, well. With the rosettes, palms, and it's more or less the same iconography too. No? Rosettes, uh, you have rosettes also in the in the tiny uh, figurines too. So, well, it's uh, all 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 the iconography revolve on the same topics. Right, right. And that medallion. Could we go back to the medallion yeah, image and just medallion, see the is, as well? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so some of those same patterns, but the central yeah. figure, do you see it as a winged figure? Is that what those, or you said caduceus? I, I said caduceus, yeah. but I, I, I would have to check what uh, Marin Ceballos is, is saying because I cannot uh, remember. Yeah, sorry to make you <laughs> summarize all of this literature <laughs> on the spot. <laughs> that was very helpful. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we have a couple of questions from YouTube. So I will interrupt my own, uh, our own internal questions here. Uh, so actually, Agnes is in the chat here on YouTube. Uh, she says, thank you for this amazing lecture, Mireya. I was going to ask you, as Helen did, to expand a bit more on the challenges of working with the artists. Are there any other challenges besides the dialogue that you wanted to highlight here? Uh, limitations of the software or uh, captioning these? Anything else I can... Uh, that you want to add to that discussion? Uh, well, more limitations. Uh, with the one of Escuyaram, no, because we have plenty of information. But for instance, with the portrait of Sophonista, it's quite challenging because it's a portrait of a unique person, no? And how can you imagine the face of a, of a exactly. unique princess, no? It's a kind of, okay, what, what, what is the main source? And that that was a really big challenge because the the artists uh, were looking at the uh, ancient photograph of the the end of the nineteenth century, the beginning of the twentieth century in, in Tunisia, no, to make some kind of of connection. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the the, the, the portraits are, are exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I admit when you were talking about getting artists involved, I was getting excited that one day I might be able to purchase for myself one of these crowns or one of these uh, pieces of fabric. So this is another step you could uh, bring these reconstructions to life and we can all do our reenactments we were scheming about last time. Okay, mm -hmm. um, so returning a little bit to uh, your narrative about Escularam, uh, you mentioned the 
rebuilding of the cave, um, this second century inscription may, might point to. Um, can you say more about what rebuilding means in this context? How do you imagine renovations to this uh, cave sanctuary in that in that kind yeah, of uh, the, language? The rebuilding also is, is what uh, I've read, yeah, because uh, this is fresh. fresh. Yeah. It's related to the artificial hole I mentioned to you. So they said that the, the inscription was put on the on, on the wall, no? Uh, was hanging on the on the wall, and the, the reconstruction of the cave only was uh, only affected this artificial area, the, the artificial entrance, and they they didn't refer to the the inner side of the of the cave, not the proper natural cave. So we okay. don't know if, if perhaps you are thinking about the cleaning the cave, no, with the yeah. with the with the votive offerings. Um, the, the, the inscription know. only mentions that they reconstruct and uh, they, Jose Angel Zamora no, thought that uh, he's referring exclusively to this artificial uh, room no, at, at the entrance of the cave. That's helpful, yeah. I, it feels like so many of our, like at Amrit, you know, you have the natural bedrock emphasized, but then built upon, right? To put a portico over it. That seems very similar here, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see. Next question. Um, trying to get to as many of these as possible. Uh, can you say anything more about the small fragment of the temple boy type figurine? Uh, it sounded like it was the only one from the corpus of that type. Um, do you see that uh, object as always associated with children's healing rituals or are there other possible interpretations that have been convincing for you? Uh, well, this, I mean, the, the, it is a very small fragment, and uh, I don't think it's a temple boy uh, with the size of a temple boy, no, but it's much smaller, and probably it's well, uh, it's connected to. Um, we have published with many Ferrer the idea of uh, winning a winning ritual. I mean, the, no, once you stop. Um, Sucking, no, and the beginning you, you change, no, your your age is a ritual of passage, no, and you introduce yeah. uh, solid food. And uh, I think in the ancient testament, no, it's mentioned this idea of the winning festival, no, so probably why not, no, um, mm. if we see the presence of children in, in La Algaida, um, these children could go there with their families, especially with their mothers, to celebrate this uh, rite of passage, no. The, yeah. the the beginning of the winning process. I love this idea, and I I hadn't been thinking of it in terms of women's agency before uh, this this clear argument you made in this paper. Um, I'm wondering too, in with Sam and Karim's con contribution to this series, they talk about women visiting a cave shrine in Lebanon where they're actually probably bathing in water, or at least. Mm -hmm you know, doing ritual ablutions as part of the sort of fertility or rite of passage, uh, maybe into marriage. Um, do you see any of the pools of water you were talking about, this mirrored surface? Does any of that seem feasible for throwing no, water? They are, no, they are small. Mm -hmm. And even the, the, the cistern outside the, the cave, it's relatively small. I don't think you can put all your body inside the water. No, perhaps you right. can put some parts. Splash right. it. Yeah. yeah. But in Algaida, I well, you have you are uh, uh, full. Of, there's plenty of water. I mean, there, it was an island, no? So uh, you can put inside the 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 the, the river or the, the the water of the ocean. So why not? Yes. Good point. Good point. Yeah. 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 Well, I know we're almost out of time, but I did realize I, I skipped part of Agnes's a second question. Um, were there any research questions you or your group developed after working with the artists? In other words, are there things you now want to know uh, because of the questions you got about this reconstruction? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we have a lot of uh, questions, especially with the Squilleran. One of the questions we were thinking about is um, who is everybody entering to the cave 
or is someone, I mean, if there is a, a, a priest or a priesthood, um, everyone is allowed to go to the Holy of Holies or uh, what are the main rights performed? Right? Great I mean, question. This, so yeah, that's something we keep thinking on. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, good luck with that one. <laughs> uh, and I know uh, if you're willing to answer maybe one more, we have yes, uh, a few. Problem. Okay. Uh, I think that there will be some curiosity about these silver embossed plaques with the eyes. Uh, can you give us a little more sense of the size of these? It looked like maybe they were punctured at the bottoms. Are they sort of the size that could cover human eyes or are they too they small are sm uh, they small. are smaller see okay. i'm sorry i didn't put the, the scale no problem but yeah. they are uh three centimeters so Ooh. they are really small yeah so i'm not you are thinking of a kind of mask no to a performative aspect no mm. Mm, i don't think it, it doesn't work like this because of the size and also because it's bronze and it's quite hard no it's not manageable no it's not easy to adapt yeah. Mm -hmm. Are they bronze or they're silver on bronze? Is I'm that sorry, what you're saying? Uh, silver. There's one silver and one bronze. Oh, okay. One yeah, silver, yeah, one bronze. Yeah, yeah you're yeah, right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, and you can't see through them. So it's, it would be a strange <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ceremony yeah. anyway. Yeah. yeah. So do you see these as something like, did your artist want to incorporate these in some way? Did you see them as something you could bring in or did she leave them out on purpose? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, it's because la, we were thinking of we want. I would like to make a drawing of Lalgaida, mm -hmm. but it's very difficult because yeah. uh, the the landscape has changed significantly yeah, yeah. from that period to now, and and the the structures I show you are not well published, and mm -hmm. I'm I'm not really sure about how to face this uh, reconstruction. I, how to put the materials? I don't know. I have other. You need ideas. another ERC grants and archaeobotanical, <laughs> yeah. and yeah, it's going to be a yeah. lot of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Aaron is cheering you on for the ERC yeah. idea, but well, the, we don't the have an ERC. We yeah. don't have. Uh, we have another kind of project, but it's yeah, not an yeah. ERC because it's quite. And in it's fact, so we have to re receive fundings from. The, we have a at the university. We have a. Um, equality you, uh, unit, no, that work for equality, gender oh, yeah. equality, diversity, and everything. And we ask for a small grant, and every year we we got it, no. Yeah. Amazing, yeah. So yeah. telling the stories of the past in an equal way as well. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, congratulations. We use it. Uh, we use it. Sorry, Ella, no, Helen, We use it for a teaching aids in our class, in our lectures. No, and you could be yes. and we work with uh, students, and it's very useful. No, because it's a teaching uh, aid, very, very useful, and the students love to work with this kind of images. Absolutely. I mean, so do I. But also, the outreach <laughs> and dissemination is so much more vivid and possible. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing these with us. Uh, this is like something to aspire to. The rest of us are 12 steps behind you all the time, but uh, we're, we know where we're going. <laughs> uh, well, we have a couple more announcements for our audience about next talks in this series, but thank you so much, Dr. Lopez Bertrand, for your contribution today. Thank you. Thank you. Right, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Maria Lopez Berchan, for your fascinating talk today. Our next lecture in our Women and Gender in the Phoenician Homeland Diaspora Lecture Series is next Thursday, March 28th at 9.30 a.m. Dr. Maroon Creech will present Phoenician Women in Textual Documentation, Epigraphical, and Literary. So we thank everyone for tuning in today, and we hope that you will join us next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>